Hello, Zondo. Hello, Kevin. We, in the last few videos, we've been talking about positioning. What is the is there and what is the right position people should be in? And also, uh, you've been discussing the new orders and how to uh, understand the difference between the preventive orders and the, the new orders. And uh, some people are questioning whether there really is a right position or they're questioning how you're describing the positioning as you see it. So uh, I think we should talk more about this. Yes, I think it's a, it's a good time. Yes, it's... Um... Uh, people are talking, well, I'm, I'm embroiled in many fights with uh, somatic teachers, of course, because they, they uh, think that there is only one way to teach the Alexander, the true way to teach the Alexander technique, and it's with uh, touch. So, and they find that uh, with touch, they are freed from uh, the problem of positioning, and they consider that uh, what I propose is positioning. So there is a quote that is coming back every single time or more or less. It's that um, uh, the right position, there is no such thing as the right position. That's, uh, it's a part of a quote from Alexander. And uh, it's quite interesting to, uh, well, to go a bit deeper first to explore the quote itself, to discover that, uh, well, what Alexander is saying is, is no such uh, definite thing. Uh, very often you, you hear there is no such thing as a red position, meaning if you are uh, asking your pupils uh, to perform a certain procedure and then judging uh, objectively what you see, as if Alexander, for example, was uh, performing a procedure, then uh, looking in his mirror and judging, what he sees in order to reason about uh, uh, the procedure is uh, followed or tried to follow and fail to follow. Uh, they consider that uh, this uh, kind of conscious control is, uh, is not what the technique is about. The technique is about flow. It's about a, a nice feeling that you experience. It is absolutely obvious that when you are told that uh, um, you wanted to perform a certain series of movements and you did not well uh, you're not told that you're fantastic you're not told that you are perfect uh, you are told that uh, well you are studying a complex mechanism <laughs> that is not easy to, to direct so it's not really pleasant and uh, uh, apparently it's necessary to make lessons pleasant in the modern Alexander technique if a lesson is not pleasant uh, this is not uh, this is not correct teaching. Well, um, of course, I cannot see things in that way. Uh, it's it's obvious that uh, we tend to react when we are personally uh, well pointed at. But uh, it's necessary to address this question of reaction, and uh, the technique is about the control of reaction. So it's difficult to imagine our pupil could start uh, discovering new ways, new manners in which to control his own reaction if he's uh, always fine during the lesson, if he's always uh, calm and collected, if he, everything goes well and he, he feels really nice experiences. <laughs> well, in, in real life, it's going to be, to be tough. It's going to be different just for the change, for the, the difference. Because in life, uh, very often, you are asked to perform new actions uh, that you could not anticipate. And you will find at first that uh, you're not performing as well I would, I, as you would like to. It's just obvious. And it's necessary to, to know ways and procedures in order to address this lack of appropriate reaction that you find yourself in. So having a teacher uh, help you control how you've been able to readjust a complex mechanism, well, it's just uh, what I'm paid for.
And it's absolutely necessary that I am truthful with my pupils and tell them when it is that uh, I can see that uh, the resulting posture and position is not correct. So uh, this is to, to start, but uh, um, well, the, the best thing is to share my screen and, and, and show you uh, from where I start uh, to, well, reason about these questions. There can be no such thing as a correct standing position for each and every person. The question is not one of correct position, but of correct coordination of the muscular mechanism concern. That's, that's where uh, the whole uh, quote comes from. And uh, as you can see, it doesn't stop there because Alexander says that moreover, anyone who has acquired the power of coordinating correctly can readjust the movements of the parts of his body to meet the requirements of almost any position while always commanding adequate and correct movements of the respiratory apparatus and perfect vocal control a fact which I demonstrate daily to my pupils. Continual readjustment of the parts of the body without undue physical tension is most be beneficial, as is proved by the high standard of health and long life of acrobats. So, uh, of course, yes, uh, uh, it is necessary to uh, address the subtlety that Alexander uh, displays in his uh, understanding. It's not, uh, there is no such thing as a correct position. Don't forget about correct positioning. Well, it's, uh, it's one thing that there is no such thing as a correct position. In fact, to mold your acts as if, uh, as if, for example, sitting could be considered a position and you should uh, uh, set yourself in the right position, hold yourself in the right position. Alexander considered that uh, sitting is not a position or standing is not a position. It's a coordination of a series of movements. And um, there is no correct standing position to direct your conception of standing because your conception of standing should be a coordination of movements. Simple as that. Now, uh, coordinating correctly. Well, when you are coordinating correctly, according to Alexander, you're assuming what he calls a position of mechanical advantage. And so they are position of mechanical advantage and position of mechanical disadvantage, which are, well, incorrect position. So, there is no such thing as a correct standing position, but there are things as incorrect standing position. This is uh, how I understand Alexander. So wh when I observe my colleagues, for example, because uh, at the moment there was an exchange with some of my colleagues because I observed their way of teaching. Uh, I, I mean, their position when they were putting on some other people. They are supposed to, uh, in fact, communicate with their hands, their own capacity, their own level of coordination, which, which is supposed to be very high. As these were not uh, young teachers, I, am, <laughs> I do not attack young teachers. Um, if I ever attack somebody, of course, I just uh, observe. And uh, I think it's interesting to tell when something some coordination of movements lead to an incorrect position. So there is no such thing as a correct standing position. Well, yes, but uh, it's very, very interesting to narrate, to describe with words what it is you see when somebody is um, performing a, pos a position. Well, uh, in order to place the hands on, on the pupil, the teacher is uh, positioning the different parts of his body 
And so consciously controlling this tells us about the conception the person has of uh, what it is to coordinate correctly. So we, we very often uh, have to deal with uh, people that have been trained on the somatic system. And uh, when they feel they are uh, moving well, when they feel they are uh, free, because they, they really check whether they are free or not with the feeling system, they have this uh, very neat, uh, clear impression that, uh, well, they are coordinating correctly. Now we see that uh, when they are under the impression that they are coordinating correctly, in fact, uh, we, we find that um, they are flattening the chest, for example, and duly lifting the front part of the chest. I will come back to this in a minute because Alexander says that uh, uh, meet the requirement of any position is uh, it's necessary to command adequate and uh, correct movements of the respiratory apparatus. And uh, it's obvious that uh, there are ways of uh, holding the chest that do not meet this requirement. And, and uh, I am not inventing, it's Alexander that has explained this. So uh, it, it's again back to the same problem is that we do not agree on what is the main definition, what, what it means to lengthen and widen the back. I have a different opinion. They think that lengthening and widening the back is having a straight spine. Yes, and I maintain that uh, Alexander has a different conception. And his conception is exemplified by the films that we have where he works with two different students. So here, again, I'm showing these images that are in, from 1951. And it's absolutely obvious at least to me, that uh, there is a hump, the, the position of the upper chest is absolutely not natural to us. It's absolutely uh, clear that Alexander has a plan, a reason plan. It's, uh, it's impossible to get that, that orientation of the upper chest relatively to the middle chest by chance. And uh, during that lesson, I really encourage uh, teachers to watch Alexander's lesson. It's absolutely obvious that he makes every effort to prevent what he calls, or what is called sometime, the flattening of the chest. There is a, a distance between the top of the thoracic spine and a vertical plane. Imagine that person lying down. If the person lies down, the gravity is going to act on the upper chest. And what is going to happen? You will have a flattening of, well, the, the main curve responsible for expanding the torso, which is uh, the primary thoracic curve in the spine. So uh, what we call, well, the, the, old, uh, the old word, the torso harmonic expansion is um, exactly the same as lengthening and widening the back. And it is seen that uh, uh, we are not discussing a position as such. We are discussing a mechanism that is made of different bony parts. These bony parts are jointed, articulated together and uh, according to the movements, you're going to give or to project to uh, the different parts of the organism, you're going to get a position of the chest, a position of the upper part of the arm relatively to the chest. As a result of the movement of, well, the spine, the thoracic spine is going to be projected in this case forward and upward. And so, the cervical spine and the head will follow forward and upward. So uh, for me, there is no question. Alexander is seen uh, projecting the shoulder girdle very, very far forward. 
And so you must understand that when the shoulder blades are going away from the spine, all the muscles and fascia that are linking the shoulder blade with the spine are suddenly stretched. They're, they're starting to pull back. Antagonistic pulls uh, is the result of an antagonistic action of the middle spine going backward and the shoulder blade going forward. In these conditions, when the, as you can see, the whole length of the palm of Alexander, palm and finger, is measuring the distance of the front of the shoulder girdle to the back, well, it's absolutely obvious that Alexander is using the mechanism of the arm to project the upper thoracic wall forward and this way resist the flattening of the torso, the flattening of, as he calls it, the flattening of the chest. So when you look at uh, the modern Alexander Technique model, it's a model that I call the model of the straight spine or the plumb line model. And when you look at the plumb line model, you find that uh, the teacher is uh, guiding the pupil to obtain a position of the upper chest relatively to the middle chest that I consider a flattening of the chest. It's uh, um, having the person flex the torso as if the person was lying down on a table with, uh, with no books. So there is a flat position. And uh, this, well, uh, is not for me a correct position. So I don't know what the, the teacher is feeling with his hands. I have no idea. Yes, but uh, it doesn't matter. What matter is that this person is getting a feeling experience that she will tend to associate with correct condition of functioning, correct condition of breathing. When it is not, it is absolutely obvious that the lungs have evolved with a thoracic curve that is made not by the movement of the person at first, but simply by the shape of the bones of the spine. Why would you flatten the primary thoracic curve? The lungs, which are, well, of course, inside the top of the rib cage, are going to be squashed and flattened. It's, it's absolutely, uh, well, everybody knows now that um, the breathing conditions, when the, the back is flattened, are improper. For example, with the COVID-19, it seemed that uh, m most of the time we don't let uh, people that have difficulty in breathing lie flat on their back with a straight spine. So we consider uh, the mechanism of the torso as capable of many different uh, actions, but there are actions that are correct because they lead to a correct functioning, and there are some that are incorrect, incorrect positioning. So to say that uh, in the technique of uh, conscious guidance and control, we position people and that is wrong, and that in the modern Alexander technique, they, they don't position people. Makes really little sense. It's obvious that during a lesson, a teacher is going to position the pupil, and the pupil is going to get a sensory experience of that position, and they will be led to, in fact, associate that position with a correct feeling. In... Uh, Conscious guidance and control lessons, there is very little of this. There is no correct feeling because, um, uh, as uh, Kirby is saying, uh, imagine I, I, I have many, many pupils that, uh, that have developed the habit of flattening the chest by lying down on a table uh, many, many times during the week. And so for them, uh, standing with an active chest 
is like something that is absolutely not comfortable. The, the, the person has to, in fact, discover that there are correct coordination of movements that leads to expanding the chest, that leads to freeing the movement of the rib cage, but that is very, very far from comfortable. It's absolutely, at first, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's strenuous. It's, uh, it, and also, very, very often, the person will say, I cannot breathe. Well, of course, uh, I don't uh, kill many of my students, you know, otherwise it would be already known. Uh, I could kill one or two and get, uh, get, um, get on with it. But uh, if it was every time a pupil says to me, I cannot breathe, that the pupil would die, well, uh, I would be in jail by now. So they do not die. Their impression of not breathing is, uh, is in fact, a contrast with their way, their habitual way of breathing. They discover suddenly that with an expanded chest, one is not breathing the way they used to breathe. And so uh, it's, um, it's a strange uh, thing to discuss with somatic teacher of the modern Alexander technique because everything seems upside down. It's, uh, they, in fact, contradict using, uh, of course, some sort of uh, defense mechanism that, uh, that tends to, in fact, contradict Alexander. Uh, very, uh, well, last, just last week, I, had a, I was commenting on an image, and one teacher said, but uh, uh, what is this business of uh, having the, uh, the upper chest forward? Of the of the back, uh, it's not because we you, you have seen Alexander uh, stooping in this way uh, that uh, uh, you should make that a, a general principle. Well, uh, the word stooping is interesting uh, because uh, it's been collapsing collapsing the chest, and um, when I look at uh, FM Alexander. And uh, it's, I, I do that quite often. So there is uh, this one that I really like very much because he's acting, he's, uh, he's playing the fool. And um, it's not exactly what I would call stooping. Yet, there are things that make you think, and you will see we are going to discuss this, that uh, Alexander positioning is really accurate. Well, uh, the position of the shoulders relatively to the top of the neck, the position of the elbows relatively to, to, to the wrist, and the position of the ribs, of the middle ribs, relative to, to the elbows, are something uncanny. I would not say that that person is stooping, of course, but I can tell you something. is from seen from the side. When you get a, a vertical tie like this, you are not flattening the chest. Alexander is performing here what I've uh, shown earlier, which is the expansion of the chest. So in the expansion of the chest, there is something very interesting, is that at first, when you require a pupil to coordinate the movement of the upper torso and middle torso in order to obtain that principle of coordination, that's how I call it, yes? We are not asking the pupil to obtain a position. We are asking the pupil to reason out the movements of different parts according to objective measurements. So we say we measure the distance from the lower part of the sternum to a wall, and we establish exactly the same distance from the upper part to the wall. And at first, it's very interesting because when you ask the person with, with or without rulers to perform such a coordination of movements, at first you will find that the person has a tendency to, to think, has a tendency to rotate down, which is um, very interesting because it's not exactly what is required. There is uh, every uh, proof, yes? that Alexander is not rotating and stooping the chest. 
when he's aligning the top of the torso and the middle of uh, the torso and the top of the middle of the torso, which is the lower part of the sternum. So there is a, a problem of conception when you see that when you ask a person to bring the upper torso forward relatively to the middle torso, it's antagonistic action, very simple. Well, you find that the person reacts systematically by going down. This is really interesting. This is where conscious control comes to help because the pupil can be told that he is going down. But not only a theory can be conceived and say, if you imagine, because the, the joint of the rib cage is at the back, that you're asked, in fact, to rotate a spot relatively to a center of rotation that is at your back, you're bound to go down. It's even obvious that even before you start the performance of the readjustments, it's obvious that you are starting to direct the movement of your eyes, of your nose, of your chin downward. What has this to do with the fact of having two parts going horizontally in opposite direction? Nothing. So this means that for the moment, you are, you, your conception of the movements of the different parts of the torso, the top part of the torso and the middle part of the torso, is such that you have an idea that you are doing a rotation and that the center of that, of that rotation is at the back. If you've got this idea in mind, anytime you're going to try and bring the top of the torso forward, you're going to go down and stoop. This is just a, a constant. This is just real, realizing that uh, we are not discussing physical movements. Uh, two physical movements. We are discussing psychophysical activity, where what the person thinks affects completely how the person moves the different parts. And so uh, the solution is to reason. Well, that will infuriate my somatic colleagues because they think that uh, uh, it's, it's only through feeling that you can direct movements. No, in this case, we absolutely need to reason and I need to have the person manipulate some objects that is similar to the rib cage and say, if you were to place the center of rotation that we imagine that the chest has to uh, comply with, and if you place that center of rotation at the front, you will find that it's absolutely conceivable to have one movement of the middle torso going back in space and one movement of the upper torso going forward in space, changing the rotation. Because then you, you find a completely new rotation where what is going to happen is that the upper torso and the upper spine with it is going to rotate forward and up. If the center of rotation is at the back, you have no other way than to rotate forward and down. The only way to rotate forward and up is to change the center of rotation. And you look at Alexander's hands and what is, what is he doing during the lesson? He's got his index finger, I think, very near the lower part of the sternum bone and he's simply helping the pupil rotate so that his head can go forward and up relatively to that new center of rotation. So, we are not discussing a correct position at the moment. We are discussing movements to obtain a correct position, which is uh, quite uh, different. But in the end, Alexander has created the condition of a correct position in standing. This is a position of mechanical in standing, position of mechanical advantage in standing. So it's, um, it's a difficult subject, I understand, knowing that uh, we were not trained during the somatic training. I had a stat training and we were not trained to reason about movements, to reason about center of rotations. Uh, it's not necessary. Because the teacher have in their hands the know the somatic knowledge that uh, that is requ required. 
Well, the more you look at uh, how modern Alexander Technique uh, manipulate people, and uh, you compare with how Alexander was manipulating people, you, well, you, you, you must realize that it's not the same thing. They, they, they do not uh, use the same coordinating principles. Well, it's more than Alexander used coordinating principles, use uh, reasoning about movements when the, the new somatic teachers, they don't. They don't reason about movements very much. It's not, uh, it's not their, their point, really. So I want to uh, finish this with two things. The first one is uh, I want to go back and, uh, and look at the, um, the, the end of the sentence. Uh, where uh, this one, I will show you. Here it is. Um, Alexander discussed the idea that it is helpful to know and to be able to acquire the right position in standing, sitting, or any other activity. And he is bringing a new thing because this is the last book. This is not uh, the first one. And uh, he's coming back to the same question about uh, acquiring the right position. And what he says is quite the, uh, subtle, quite interesting. He says that to pass from uh, wrong to right conditions associated with posture and functioning means change. Well, what that sentence says is that uh, uh, there are wrong condition or right condition associated with posture. So uh, to say that there is no uh, such thing as a right position is quite strange. <laughs> uh, you, I, for myself, the way I understand this is that, uh, yes, you should not think of a right position. You should think of a model of coordinating principles that are leading to conditions that create the correct posture. That correct posture, you cannot, you cannot obtain it today or tomorrow or the day after tomorrow because it's an evolving thing. Um, it's, it, when you are saying that a person is, uh, is trying to assume a right position, well, depending on how you control, but if you control with a video recording system of motion, you will find that the person, in fact, use principles, for example, to obtain uh, a position, but that is never, never exact. That is never the coordinating principles as you can conceive them in your mind. There is always the human factor and uh, the tiredness and, uh, uh, well, all the experience of use you've had before that is going to enter in the picture. There are so many movements that are involved in just, uh, in just bringing the elbow forward that uh, to think that you can really set yourself in a correct position makes no sense. You can discuss movements, coordination of movements, simultaneity of movements, but uh, you cannot discuss a correct position. It's well, it, it, it's, it's humanly impossible. Yet, uh, Alexander is not saying that we should not thrive to develop a better positioning. No, not at all. Because he says to pass from wrong to right condition associated with posture means change. You have to in enter a new world uh, that is uh, like never ending, a world of change. And so what Alexander says is that if a person is to make this change successfully, it must be by a gradual process of change from day to day so that the effect of the readjustment of the bony structure, the abdominal viscera, the vital organs, the interference with the habitual sense of equilibrium, and the disturbing experience of in doing what feels wrong may not retard the process. So yes, 
we are requesting a readjustment of the bony structure. So uh, we, we, when we discuss a readjustment of the bony structure, you must understand that there are positions that are incorrect. And you can just uh, observe this, this, this incorrect position. And once you start to narrate which kind, which series of movements are leading to that incorrect condition of functioning, that incorrect posture. Because the, the incorrect condition of the functioning for Alexander is associated with posture, a position. So if you notice and you can narrate which are the movements that concerted together bring about these wrong conditions of functioning, you're in fact reproducing exactly what Alexander explained in the, the, the fourth chapter of Man's Superiority Tense, which is called Conscious Guidance and Control. It's uh, from being able to describe these incorrect movements coordination that he was able to create new orders of movements, which concerted together lead to an improvement in posture and functioning. So there is uh, such a thing as a right position in construction. That is, you are involved in a process where you are starting to accept to do what feels wrong because what you do normally, the kind of movements you're doing normally are adjusted to your sensory appreciation. You feel fine when you're doing uh, an incorrect position, an incorrect positioning, if you want. The person is, uh, is asked to bring the elbow forward and you just observe what are the movements of the different parts of the torso when the person is bringing the elbow forward, simple. Yes, and if you find that the person is flattening the chest, is protruding the abdomen, is uh, arching the back when moving the elbow forward, you can say to the person, you've just assumed the wrong position. There is nothing wrong with that. It's absolutely, it's absolutely uh, perfect uh, and corresponds to Alexander's idea of uh, what he is, is uh, understanding of positioning. So uh, I'm, I'm taking uh, just a second to show how Alexander describes uh, what he sees. So I've shown you uh, this picture. So I want you to have this picture in mind and I'm going to link up that picture with what Alexander is uh, saying. So um, let's start with the, the beginning. So we, we have a, a boy who stoops very much. So it's a person that, that stands with the, the upper torso really pulled down. Yes, it's a, it's a common habit. It's a coordination of the different movements of the parts of the torso where the middle torso is going back in space and the upper torso is going down. Uh, that creates what we call stooping. Yes. Um, and... Um, Suddenly, we are requesting the person to perform an act and he's told to stand up straight. And if he's told to stand up straight, you will observe that he will at once make undue physical effort to carry, to carry out the order thus crudely given with the results that the shoulders will be thrown backward and upward, the shoulder blade still further protruded, that is backward, and the front and upper part of the chest unduly elevated and expanded. Unduly elevated and expanded, if you remember, it's flattening the chest. Yes? If the person is flattening the chest, there will be a narrowing, a sinking, and a flabbiness of the lower dorsal and posterior thoracic region. Yes? A narrowing, a sinking and a flabbiness. Uh, it's, uh, e even in this image, it's uh, for me clear that the creases in the pullover are indicating something of great interest. Is that the thoracolumbar fascia, that enormous spring at the back, 
is only useful when you can stretch it. And uh, when the shoulder blades are protruded backward, which means that the shoulders are very far back and quite high, well, in that case, there are no action of, of the largest muscle of the back to widen the fascia. And so there is a flabbiness here. Yes, and the pelvis is slightly rotated forward. If you can make such comments, yes, um, you can use the same narration in order to create new orders of movements for the different parts to coordinate a new position of mechanical advantage. Undue arching of the lumbar spine, shortening of the body, so you understand that by the body, Alexander means the torso, an armful stiffening of the arm and neck instead of the fullness, broadness, and firmness of the back. Free mobility of the chest, the chest walls will resulting in a normal curve of the lumbar region and a comparatively lengthening of the spine. With the arms hanging vertically, the relative position of the parts of the th thorax where the lungs are situated will be seen to be in front of the arm instead of being as it should be behind them. Uh, the last uh, idea it says that uh, we, we, we are looking at the upper arm hanging vertically and um, what he's saying is that if the rib cage is forward of the upper arm and elbow yes well of course the shoulders are uh, pushed backwards, protruding the shoulder blades, and uh, as I said earlier, flattening the chest, flattening the upper chest. It's quite obvious that uh, when Alexander is seen sitting playing the fool, he's not having the elbow back. No, certainly not. They are outward, they are forward, they are down. I say down because it's, it's absolutely clear that the top of the chest is higher than the upper part of the arm. So he's, he's got quite a fall of the shoulder. Comparative, well, very similar to the one that we can see with this gentleman. So uh, these are elements of positioning. This is a position for me. And uh, uh, there are other pictures of Alexander where, well, curiously, again, we, we see that uh, there is a tendency to bring the elbows out. So at first you may think, well, this is because it's, it's cold. And I want to show that uh, it may be not that simple. Alexander is really, in fact, performing for the camera and is really showing something. It's absolutely obvious that he's not collapsing the chest. He's not unduly lifting the front part of the chest to flatten the chest. That for me is absolutely obvious and uh, is certainly using the elbow in, in a way that is very, very reminiscent of that one. Yes, these images are, are taken at, well, 10 years interval and still is uh, performing the same position. So uh, it could be interesting. I've asked uh, Kevin if you wanted to uh, to play a game where uh, we see what is meant by coordinating movements and uh, assuming a posture. Here we are again, and uh, we are going to play a lesson, a very simple lesson of conscious guidance from afar. So uh, there is no such thing as a correct standing position, but there is such thing as a control position. So in order to control the position, what I would like you to do very quickly is to set a ruler on the floor against the front of the legs of the chair. Yeah. A small one. Yes, that's it. Set it on the very front. Now, I want you to stand and touch it with the back of your heels. Yes, that's a control position for me. I know exactly where you are relative to the chair, where you are, the base of the whole organism, which is the foot, is situated. Yes? And so, uh, how do we proceed in conscious guidance system? Well, it's very simple. We ask the person to perform uh, an act. And so, uh, the act I'm going to ask you is very simple. There is a bony 
pelvis, a bony uh, part in the lower part of the torso. And as we are looking at you from the side, the action I'm requesting is just to place the tip of the thumb, tip of the left thumb, of course, because it's the one that is facing the camera at the moment, on the, on the side, on the bony side of the pelvis, yes, in such a way as to touch the higher side of the pelvis and also hooking the index, the index finger forward to touch with the index what we call the iliac spot, which is the anterior, anterior superior iliac crest of the spine, yes? So uh, now you understand what I mean. I want you to set the hand to the side, yes? And um, um, yes, and I would like you to perform that action counting to three so that you know exactly when you start the movement and uh, at three, you should stop, yes, any movement that you've made. When you're ready, I want you to count to three and perform the gesture I requested. One, two, three. That's it. Okay. So we are going to address this question and we are going to have a look at it, uh, to look how it, uh, how it evolved, how it goes. And so if you want, for the moment, you can, you can stop. I just taken a picture of, uh, of you uh, performing the action and... Um, I will join that picture uh, with the recording. So um, when you move the hand uh, toward the target, yes, uh, did you consider any movements of the different parts of the torso that could help you assume the gesture? The I, uh, I consider the position of the elbow. Yes, I, you consider the position of the elbow. I'm interested in the movement of the parts of the torso, though. You understand that, the, uh, of course, the target of the movements of the fingers are uh, the pelvis, which is one part of the torso. And uh, could there be a way that you could move the pelvis to help yourself? I could rotate the pelvis backwards to make more space for the fingers to in the hand to reach. Yes, in that way, there will be less trajectory backward, yes? And so, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm interested also in the, the position of the wrist. When you, in fact, guided the different movements, I don't think you guided the movement of the torso, and uh, I'm not so sure you guided the movement of the wrist. Was the wrist flexed or extended when you reached? Maybe you don't remember. Could, do you know what I mean by flexing the wrist and extending the wrist? It was, um, I had it turned inwards. Yes. And uh, could you show to the camera what is meant by flexing the wrist? Yes, that's flexing the wrist. And now could you show me extending the wrist? Yeah. So uh, when you plan the movement of placing the thumb on the top of the iliac bone, ilium bone, and uh, the index on the front of it, um, do you plan to flex or to extend the wrist? I didn't think about it. Oh, you didn't think about it. So uh, the resulting movement of the wrist was, uh, in fact, subconscious. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Uh, now that you're thinking about it, what do you think would be uh, the best uh, position for the wrist when you uh, set contact with the fingers and the lower torso? Flex. Uh, sorry, uh, extended. Extended. Can you explain why? Why did you make that choice? Uh, because it's helping the arm, upper arm come forward. Ah, yes, you are still, you're already thinking of uh, lengthening the back by having the upper torso come forward. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. That, in that, you're correct, yes. And um, um, should it uh, be planned for the last part of the movement or for the beginning of the movement of the arm? Uh, beginning. From the very beginning, that's, that's again correct. Wow, you're too good today. And so um, now, 
we are going to see a movement of the wrist. So what should be the direction of the wrist? Well, um, my question is a, a bit complex because it's not, it's too open. My question would it be, uh, do, do you think you have to go forward with the base of the palm, with the, 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 just the, the wrist or backward in space when you start the gesture? I don't know. Well, it, uh, well, according to the current position of the wrist and the position of the pelvis, it should go back. Many yeah, people, when they... In, yeah. in total, yes. I just yeah. wasn't sure whether I had to go forward first or not. Yes, yes. But uh, uh, last time you went forward first, but um, maybe for another reason is that many people, when they direct the, the wrist back in space, they have a tendency to direct the elbow and the shoulder back in space, which goes exactly against what you wanted to perform before, which was to expand the back by having the upper torso come forward. And so uh, do you think it's possible to have the base of the palm, which is for us the wrist, backward in space at the same time as directing the elbow forward in space? Yes. Okay. So when we say forward in space, uh, there is a difficulty is that most people think that they understand what we mean, but it's necessary to, to, be, to be quite accurate in these conditions. So could you please place the base of the right palm on top of the rebate line, which is the front of the middle torso? Yes. At the moment, do you think that uh, the middle torso is forward of the wrist or is it backward? Forward. It's forward. Okay. Is it forward of the elbow or backward relatively to the elbow? It's currently forward of the elbow. Yes. OK, so when I say uh, I want to move the tip of the elbow forward, of course, it's relative to the middle torso. Yes. And so uh, there is quite a long distance to, in fact, to make with the elbow. So it would be much, much better to, in fact, uh, uh, well, cut the, the apple in two and have uh, not only a movement of the elbow forward, but more a movement of the middle torso backward. Yes. So if you combine a movement of the middle torso backward and a movement of the elbow forward, you, you should easily get to uh, a position of the elbow and a position of the shoulder that is forward of the middle torso, which is what we want to lengthen the back. Do you understand? Yeah. Yes. OK. Well, there is a last difficulty. The last difficulty is that the target we are, well, we have chosen, I have chosen, sorry, which is the first target is the top of the ilium bone on the side of the torso with the sun. It requires the base of the palm to go up in space. And last time, uh, when you went up, I must say that the elbow went up and your shoulder went up too. So there was a, a very complex situation where uh, the movement I was requesting of you tended to have the upper chest, uh, well, flattened. And if we want the opposite, well, you need to be able to counteract the up movement of the wrist that is necessary by a down movement of the elbow. So do you think it's possible to have the elbow go down when the wrist is going up? Yes. How is that possible? Because they're, they're joining. Yes. And so what is the necessary movement to be able to have the elbow go down when the wrist goes up? Can you, can you name it? Yes. Sorry, say again, please. Yes. I, I want to know what is the necessary movement you have to make with the elbow to allow the elbow to go down when the wrist is going up. It has to go out, forward, and down. Yes, it has to go outward very, very clearly. The, the, uh, the forward and down we have already discussed before because it's forward relatively to the ribs uh, that you're pointing with your palm of the right hand. Yes. And uh, now we are discussing outward. So uh, does it go outward after the wrist have started to move or before? 
um, would need to be before. Absolutely. So even if I'm going to see the two movements as occurring at the same time on screen, you have to plan them with a difference. Yes, in uh, uh, engagement, because if you engage the wrist first, well, you are going to see the elbow go up, certainly. Yes, it's even possible, I will tell you a little secret, it's even possible to have the, the wrist move up in space just by moving the elbow outward and down and forward, as you said. Yes? So we agree on the fact that uh, there will be a new organization of the movement of the, the arms. Do you also understand that we are discussing a profound change in the movement of the parts of the torso? Yes. Yes? The middle torso has a really to go back. The upper torso has really to go forward for you to succeed. When you're ready, I want you to give me a three while connecting the sum with the highest part of the pelvis on the side and the index with the front of the pelvis. When you're ready. One, two, three. That's it. Yeah. Okay. So you, you will notice that uh, you have coordinated different movements. We have discussed these movements. Yes. Uh, of course, uh, there is a resulting position. Well, this resulting position is interesting. It's not exactly the same as the one you assumed last time I asked you, I requested you to place the sum and index on the pelvis. It's a very different movement you've made. This one is much more integrated. There are many, many more parts that have been consciously directed. As a result, uh, well, the result is for all to see. You're not... Uh, assuming the same standing position. And the position of your elbow is reminiscent of the position of Alexander's elbow. And so you, you will discover through this that to position himself in the way he did, Alexander was using a system of conscious guidance. The idea is not to fiddle with the position once you're there. The idea is to, well, consciously direct and control a series of movements. I think this, this will make it clearer for people that are watching us. Otherwise, they have the impression that we are discussing old sentences by Alexander and that there is very little link with a real lesson. This is a short but a very real lesson. Thank you very much, Kevin. So uh, have you see, as you've seen, uh, conscious guidance and control of a series of movements is uh, a very real, uh, practical activity. And um, there is a question that arises very often. It's the question of individuality, uh, personality. Uh, there, is, there is no such thing as a right position for everyone. Is the person going to lose a bit of, uh, of his personality because he's having conscious guidance and control lessons? Um, in fact, the method that is offered is, deals with uh, general principles. Yes? Uh, uh, it's uh, realizing in thought, planning, an act of delivery, uh, performance. You're, you're placing the elbow and the torso in a certain relation. And so uh, th there is um, an impossibility. That's how I see it. An impossibility ability to lose personality because of it. It's, uh, you're just learning how to use your mind in order to solve complex problems you're just uh, uh, starting to see that it's possible for you to have different things in mind before you act, that you stop the normal action, which is everybody knows how to place the, the index on, on the front of the pelvis. Well, the question is, uh, is open. Does everybody know how to place the index on the front of the pelvis while in fact expanding the chest? while uh, having the upper torso uh, really move forward and up? Well, no, not so. It's something that you can learn to narrate, to explain to some other people, and um, it makes reasoning 
the first element in this. Uh, and you, you are not losing personality because you're reasoning. Far from it. <laughs> what What is your... Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yes. You're adding to your whole person by reasoning about your movements yeah. because you're doing these movements anyway. You're just doing them subconsciously. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I don't see why people are concerned that they might lose their personality. Um, okay. Thank you, Jean-Do. Uh, we will see everyone in the next video. If you want to book a lesson with Jean-Do, you can go to the link underneath this video and we'll see you the next time. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Bye. Bye-bye.